uh, calendar is we have an event called BACD Pitch to Win. It's an opportunity to pitch your business idea and win. Um, the prizes are up to about $10,000. There's three winners and three different types of prizes, some cash and some other things. It's taking place during the Dune and Durham week, which if anybody doesn't know about that week, uh, we'd love to tell you more. It is a celebration of entrepreneurship <coughs> around the world. And in Durham, we do about 40 events that take place across Durham region. Um, BACD leads the organization of it, but it's not possible without the 25 partners, 30 partners that we have that are uh, involved in that. And so it's events that take place all across Durham. They're either networking events, educational events, um, opportunities to meet investors. We have two trade shows. So there's a lot that goes on in that week, and it's mostly free to celebrate entrepreneurship. So it's uh, doitindurham.biz. Um, our mission is to inspire businesses to start here, to grow here, and to hire people here because it's about creating a strong community in Durham region. And bringing us all together and working together is how we do that. So I'd like to invite Frank, my partner out here, to talk a little bit more about um, the speaker. Thank you. Oh, well, hello again. Um, I love this event. I wanted to thank you again for being here today. We know you have a choice and we're very delighted and happy that you chose it to be with us today. I also want to give a special welcome to uh, the young uh, guns in the room. There's a program called Up Next, so there's about eight or nine students here, and it's really a program that we, as Durham Region, put on to help them with launching a business, uh, skill set, and it's a three-day program, and it ends on uh, Thursday. Sorry, yes, Thursday. So one of the episodes that we're doing is talking about sales, so we thought, what best way to do it uh, as a startup than to bring them here, okay? So would you guys just mind standing up? Because if you can help them in any way, we'll be ever be appreciative. And that's here, and that's here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, thank you, and thank you for coming, and then we're doing carpool back. So again, thank you very much. This is actually our 15th session, and it's one of my favorite sessions because I, we get to all learn and hear some stories, uh, startups, we tried to do something very different uh, this year with the lineup, as you know. We wanted to make sure that there's also a lot of startups that they can share their journey. I'm always on the lookout for someone that can speak here. And I first met our speaker um, at one of our events, which we, uh, as OPN, Open People Network, we run a pitch at event. And Tim got up there and pitched, and I thought, what the heck is this? He's got an application for parking in, in, in North America, and he used to be an Uber driver? How the heck did this happen? So uh, I heard him pitch once or twice, and then I spoke to Jeffrey Poppin, who you guys know, and I said, Jeffrey, do you think that Tim would be interested in sharing his journey? And then what I found out that is, is that Tim not only loves to share his journey, but he actually uh, speaks on a regular basis as a lecturer on sales and marketing. So we're in for a pretty cool treat today, okay? Also, I wanted to point out Pavel. Pavel was our speaker last year. Um, <laughs> And, uh, sorry, last month. And the reason I, I'm, I'm pointing out these people is not to put you on the spot, Pavel, but what Tim is gonna speak today is about the shared economy. And what we've got going on here is a sharing of people wanting to share their journey to inspire you. And if you, as Teresa said, if you can take just a couple of those and apply it to your business, I think it's a win, okay? So I would like to just uh, read a, a short a bio on Tim. I have the font at the biggest font possible so I don't have to put on my glasses. <laughs> Tim Wooten, founder and CEO, Rover Parking. As an active Air Airbnb host and former UberX driver, Tim is a user and thought leader of everything in the shared economy. Tim has turned around several businesses and prior to Rover, grew and exited a manufacturing business in Toronto. Over the past three years, Tim has grown Rover into the biggest peer-to-peer -peer parking company in North America and has been recognized by Ernest & Young, Pricewaterhouse, Cooper, and the Globe and Mail for the innovative concepts. With an entrepreneurship degree from Dalhousie, an MBA from Queens, and a lecturer at McMaster University on sales and marketing, Tim enjoys the privilege of inspiring and being inspired by other entrepreneurs. <laughs> and that's what this is all about, and that is friggin' awesome. Mm -hmm. Please. Join me in welcoming Tim with a big germ. He's never been out here before to the stage. Tim, come on up. Thank you, Frank. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out this morning. 
great to uh, great to come out here and great to uh, tell you guys a little bit about Rover Parking. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on myself and how I wound up going down the crazy route of starting my own company. And then I'm going to go through starting a marketplace, what a marketplace is, how you can start a marketplace. And then if we have time, I want to be mindful of time, do a short little exercise that I have found really helps me and has helped Rover um, in our different sales processes and in making really quick, really quick decisions. So um, Frank, thanks for the, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in Quebec. 1,500 people, small, one stoplight, no Tim Hortons. It was, uh, it was a very, very small town. And I was there until I was about 17 years old, um, at which point I left and I actually came near here. I went to Port Hope and went to school there for two years. Went out east to Dalhousie and did a degree in entrepreneurship. <coughs> that was, I guess, 15 years ago now. And the way they taught entrepreneurship 15 years ago in Halifax is very different than what a three-day course would be today. Um, it was very much based on fundamentals which you need, but it wasn't based on technology and the really quick, fast decision making that you need to do when starting a new company anywhere in the world right now. Technology has drastically changed how you can create things and with that comes new sales tactics, comes new business fundamentals, comes new ways to get something off the ground and new ways to do it really, really, really fast to understand if people are going to like or buy your product because you know, sales generally and starting business generally required a ton of capital to do so, whether it's employees, whether it's getting the office space, whether it's building a tangible product. You can now, like Rover, build an app with a developer, developer and get it in the app store for free. You don't actually have to spend any money if you have the development talent and someone to go out there to help you do it. So what's happening is a lot of people may build stuff that people don't actually want. And so what I want to go through with you guys today after sharing a little bit about Rover is making sure you understand how to build something and sell something that people do want. And for those in traditional sales roles that are here, how you can maybe relook at how you're selling your businesses currently and take it back a step and see if there's new ways you can reach your customers. So just so I get a sense, how many people here are in the entrepreneurial startup space? Okay, a lot, amazing. And then sales roles in, in general? Okay, they're one and the same, yeah, get it, get it, got it. Um, okay, cool. So. So what I'll do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about Rover first. Um, and this thing's not working. We may be frozen. It's, while I talk about Rover, because I don't need slides, could someone maybe try and figure out if I can get those slides working? Um, so, I, so I started Rover about three years ago um, in Toronto. And as Frank alluded to, I was an UberX driver and I was a host on Airbnb. And the reason that I did that, <coughs> aside from making money from driving Uber and from being a host on Airbnb, was to understand the dynamics of the market, was to understand why the supply side of the equation would actually want to do this. You know, why would you want to let a stranger in your home and sleep in your bed and allow them access to everything personal in your life. Why, why, why would you want to do that? Is, is the money actually worth it? I love Airbnb. I had a fantastic time and made pretty good money off Airbnb. I also had people destroy my home on Airbnb, which is a whole other story. And, and Airbnb did a wonderful job actually fixing it. Um, but I love doing it and, and the juice was worth the squeeze. You made enough money to, to make it worthwhile. On the Uber side of things, I actually didn't like driving for Uber. I found that the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. In order to actually make money, you needed to spend 
four or five hours driving, and after that point, after your gas, after the wear and tear in your car, you know, you were making less than minimum wage. And so when I was thinking about starting Rover, the question was, what on the supply side, the person who provide the marketplace dynamics, what on that supply side is easy enough that people will actually do it? And I did not come up with Rover right away. You know, the, the MBA in me was trying to think of all these different markets that, that this could work in. And I did not come up with parking until one day I was driving to a buddy's place in the annex. And I couldn't find a parking spot, yet I saw 10 empty driveways just sitting there not being used. And, and it kind of clicked. And the thought went through my head, you know, how big is the parking market? Is this something can work? What? what are the issues from the supply side of the owners that are going to cause it to happen? And, and that's why I wound up starting Rover, because, you know, there's free parking here, and, and that's great, but drive to downtown Toronto, and you're paying anywhere from, you know, if you find a deal, nine bucks a day, but if you don't really know where you're going, you can pay upwards of 50 bucks a day. Like, it's, it's unbelievably expensive. So there's a huge lack of supply, um, and it's very time consuming to find. One of the stats in New York is that the average person spends four days a year trying to find parking. Four days a year <laughs> trying to find a parking spot. Four days a year to try and find a parking spot that they're paying $50 a day for. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolute insanity. Um, so we looked at the market, and the market in North America is a $30 billion market. So that's how much money gets spent on parking in a year. 30% of traffic congestion comes from people circling the block looking to find a parking spot. So we found a problem and we found a need. And all we tried to do with Rover <coughs> is transform empty space into revenue. So we give any homeowner with a driveway, every small business that's closed on evenings and weekends, every apartment building, every condo, church, school, the ability to rent their parking space out when they're not using it. So picture someone in Toronto who drives to work from 9 to 5. They can make money off that asset from 9 to 5. Think of the businesses that are closed on evenings and weekends. They can make money off those spots on evenings and weekends. And all they have to do, coming back to my original point, all they have to do, the only thing they have to do to make this money is to make sure that spot is available when they say it's available. And that's it. They don't have to give a key to someone to enter your house. They don't have to drive someone from point A to point B. All they have to do is make the spot available when they say it's available. That sounds super easy. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not. We're, we're lazy, and it's very hard to attract people's attention to do what you want them to do. And, and that's what a marketplace is. I mean, how many, how many people in this room do you think, like how many of you have thought about starting a marketplace in the last sort of five years or thought about Uber or talked about Uber or Airbnb or any of them, right? Like they're in the news. We have a couple of people who got handed the back because they make sense, right? Airbnb for parking, it makes sense. It's relatively simple to understand. You have a driveway that's empty in an area where people might want to park. Why not try and make money off of it? Things that are easy to understand aren't always easy to get people to use it. And I'm sure everybody who's here in sales right now is selling a product and they walk into a meeting and they get an okay response to it and they're sitting there like, I don't understand why these aren't flying off the shelves. Like my product is so damn good, everybody should be buying it. And when we deal with marketplaces, and this is what I want to talk about today, is that we have to deal with two sides of the equation, right? So we have two customers. We have to deal with the homeowner as a spot, and we have to deal with the person who actually wants to park there. So in essence, we're running two entirely different businesses. We're running two different marketing strategies. We're running two different sales strategies. We're running completely different value propositions for both sides of the marketplace. I knew this going into it when I was starting Rover. You know, you know that you have two different types of customers. 
but you don't understand how much time that actually takes and how process oriented you need to get in order to actually build a marketplace. So, I mean, everyone's obviously heard of Uber, Airbnb, Kijiji, and I put classifieds at the bottom because really marketplaces have been around forever. I mean, even take parking, for example. How many signs have you seen in someone's driveway, you know, 20 years ago even that said, call, you know, call this phone number to rent monthly? I mean, marketplaces have been around forever. All technology has done has given a way to do this at scale. But scale is something that is really, really, really hard to achieve. And it comes down to using smart sales tactics and strategies in order to actually get there. So what I want to go through today with you guys is what to look for when starting a marketplace. So while I am focusing this conversation on marketplace, it really does tie into every different business out there because all it is is concentrating on customers. So if you're not interested in starting a marketplace, do think about this stuff with regards to your own job and how you do go about attracting new customers, how you go about attracting new talent, how you manage your people. Like all of it comes down to what I'm going to talk about here because I'm going to talk about the startup mentality and the startup mentality is using really simple strategies to get things done very quickly that show results. That, that's really it. In, in startup, you don't have the luxury of time. You don't have money, you don't have resources, and thus every second that you have and every day becomes so, so important to getting stuff done, which means you need to always be moving forward. So I'm going to talk about what to look for in starting a marketplace, how to build one, what I've learned. I'm going to go through a couple sales techniques, and then I want to do an actual example with you guys. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you, what do you think a marketplace product needs? Like what pops to your head for a marketplace product to succeed? So why is Uber successful or why is Airbnb Unique. successful? Unique. An idea that no one's thought of before really. Okay, for sure. Now st stay on unique. What else needs to be unique? Advertising. Okay. Identity. Pardon me? Identity. Yeah. Keep going. A market that's monopolized. So, like yes and no, yeah. Yeah. I think it has to be very easy to use, very fast, very quick, very easy, convenient. It has to be, for, for sure. And yeah, pardon me? And to make my life better. Make it better, and that's the customer side. What you really need is unique supply. You need a supply that doesn't already have a million channels to sell that product. Right? If, if you were selling parking in 25 different ways already, it's going to be hard to come in and be that broker because all you are at the end of the day is a broker between customer and owner of the spot. So if you're not providing a good enough service as a broker and if it's not easy enough to actually use, you'll never create that marketplace. So you need something with very, very high fragmentation. Um, Taxis is actually a good example of that because there are so many different taxi companies out there. Um, you know, other great examples would be um, contractors. You know, has anyone used Homestars or Handy or any of those apps where you have all of these contractors out there, yet when you go to renovate your kitchen, you have no idea who to actually go to. You're like, I want a review. So you have that broker to help out. The second one on that, which makes it a little more difficult, is in a way in marketplace, loyalty isn't your friend. Because if, if the two people like each other, so if you get that contractor to do your kitchen, chances are you're going to go back to that contractor to do your living room or to do your garage or to do your bathroom you're not going to go through the marketplace again because you're giving me 30% in order to create that relationship. 
So you need to look for something that has high fragmentation and high frequency. There needs to be a lot of transactions that are happening and there can't be that loyalty to it. So parking is a great example of that on a daily basis because you're not going to go knock on someone's door and give them $10 cash to park in their driveway. You're just, you're just simply not going to do it on a daily basis. You might, however, do it on a monthly basis. And so you have to be really careful about that frequency because when the frequency goes down, you run into disintermediation and you run into getting cut out of the equation. And if that happens before you've made money off of your users, you just simply will not create a profitable business. I think we had a, had a yeah, question here. Sorry, I just saw there's a book written there. I was just wondering what the book was. <laughs> um, Wait, which one? It says there's a book written by this guy. Oh, yeah, so, so Ted Graham. Um, he actually used to be lead of innovation at PwC. He's now lead of innovation at GM. Wrote the book Uber for Everything. Oh, awesome. um, and you, re you really should check it out. It goes through the entire industry on the sharing economy and really kind of says that there is a book called, you know, there's, there's every industry is doing some sort of technology play around Uber and Airbnb. Um, yeah, it's really good. Um, so high fragmentation, high frequency. And then total addressable market. This to me is actually one of the biggest ones. You know, is, is the market that you're going after actually big enough? And the mistake that a lot of people make, and I'd argue to say that I even made it to start, is they look at the total market. So I told you that the total parking market was $30 billion in North America at the beginning of this presentation. That's not my total addressable market. There's, there's no way I can go after $30 billion with the type of parking that I'm creating. So when you think about the solution you're trying to create, you need to think about what that addressable market actually is. Who are the people that you're actually going to go after and how are you actually going to get to them? And that's where sales strategies really come in. And, and at the end of this, this is the you know, this is the little exercise we'll do, is about customer segments and is about sales channels and how, and how you actually get to them. Um, so once you've come up with this idea um, and once you think that it would work in a marketplace, you need to then start the product. Um, if you build it, they will come is completely false. Um, there, there is no chance that will ever work. I mean, to give you an example on Rover, you know, we launched Rover in July of 2015 with absolutely no parking spots on the system. You know, we didn't know what to expect. We were doing this crazy idea asking people to rent out the driveway by the hour in front of their home. And we, we got a ton of press. Um, which was kind of our own fault. We went to City Hall when Uber was protesting and went and talked to every reporter that was there talking to the Uber protesters and said, hey, we're a Toronto-based startup. You know, we're doing something similar. We're also breaking the law. You should write about us. Um, and, and, and they wrote about us and it was awesome. I, I, felt, I felt great. We were on the Globe. We were on, you know, we were on CTV. We were on CBC. Like, we got a ton of press. But we had no parking spots. So people went on to the app. We had thousands of people download the app from this press. People went onto the app and they opened the map screen and that's how it works on Rover is you go to a map screen and it shows pins on a map and then you choose the spot that you want to park in. And there were like three pins on the map. So, so the app was basically useless for everyone who was downloading it. And, it, and it, really, it really shot us in the foot because we, we used our one play with the press. And the press doesn't write about a launch twice. They, they only write about it once. And so this first step, which is seeding a marketplace, was a big mistake that we made at Rover. Like we should have, we should have stayed under the radar. We should have got 100 parking spots in a very tight local area and then got, went and got the press.
because then it would have been useful. What wound up happening is those thousands of people who downloaded it in that first two weeks don't use Rover at all. They opened it, they deleted the app. Our attention span for apps is so minimal. We delete them from our phone all the time. And, and we actually lost them. So seeding a marketplace becomes very, very, very important. And I mean, I think this goes across any sort of, any sort of sales organization or any startup. And, and what you have to do is figure out first if people want to use your product, right? You know, that's sort of the basis. Talk to as many people as possible. Understand if they actually want to use it. You know, when you talk to your friends, they're going to say, yeah, this is a great idea. Thanks, guys. You know, that's not helpful at all. You know, tell me it's a bad idea if it's a bad idea because I'm about to sink my entire life into this. But you can do this procedurally, and I'm sure everyone has heard this before, but it works, and it's, it's the five whys, right? When you ask someone if they like something and they say yes, ask them why, and then they'll get a little bit deeper, and then ask them why again, and they'll get a little bit deeper, and they'll get a little bit deeper, and then you might get to a point where it's like, yeah, you know, I like it, but I wouldn't use it. And, and that's something you really need to get to quickly. And the only way to do that is to pick a really small area. And, the, and this, to me, is specific to technology. But pick a really small area or a really small subset of customers and make it work with them, right? Everyone could use Rover. Every single person who drives needs to park their car somewhere and could use Rover. That doesn't mean everyone's going to use Rover, right? And it comes back to your sales channels and your customer segments. So start small and figure out what that is. There's a company, there's a company in Toronto called Ritual. Does, does anyone know Ritual? So we have a couple. So Ritual is this amazing, it's an amazing company that just essentially allows you to skip the lines when you go pick up food. So I mean, I get Mucho Burrito all the time because it's right outside my office. And you go down there. And if you were just to go down and wait in line, it would take, let's say, seven to eight minutes to get your burrito. Instead, you order it before you get there. And you go in, and it's already there, and it's ready to go. It's essentially like calling for pickup, but it's all, but it's all done through an app. They just raised $70 million. They're a Toronto-based startup. They raised $70 million. This is on top of $30 million that they've already raised. The way they were able to do this was they started very small and they proved that they could do something in a small area. So they started on King West in Toronto. They literally started on an area between Spadina and Bathurst. They signed up 25 restaurants. That's it. They're like, hey, I'm going to go get my supply side first. They signed up 25 restaurants. They even paid for the inventory, right? They weren't making any money. They went to these restaurants. They said, hey, sign up for Ritual we'll give you $200 for doing this. We just want to see if people are going to do it. So it's kind of the fake it till you make it standpoint. So they got the 25 offices on here. And their technology at the beginning, it was not great. I mean, the way that the, way that the restaurants got the order is that the users placed the order through the app. It came to Ritual's head office, which, I don't know, was six people. One of the six people then called the restaurant and said, hey, can I get a chicken burrito with guacamole? Blah, blah. So essentially did what you would do if you called directly. Got in there, and it worked. They went around to all the offices in that area, and they were able to show, they were able to increase revenue for each of those restaurants over a three-month period. They took that small repu replicable process, and they just went neighborhood by neighborhood, by neighborhood, by neighborhood. And they were able to take the data that they learned from doing this in a really small area to investors and say, hey, here's what it costs for us to acquire a customer. Here's what it costs for us to acquire a restaurant. It takes three months for us to break even on that cost. And now we're making 20% margins. Give me $100 million. Now, it's obviously, not that, it's, ob it's obviously not that easy, not even close. And it was a proven founder who had done this. And so he had investors who invested in him previously. But what he did so well, and I, I sat down with this guy, and the reason I tell this story is, is he, like, he 
rip the strip off of me for, for what I was doing. He's like, Tim, you're, you're trying to focus on way too big of an area, which I was. I was trying to focus on Toronto and not on a small area of Toronto. And he said, all you have to do is prove that this concept works. And this goes for any business, any e-commerce, anywhere, is if you can't make it work with a small subset of people or with the segment that you think is the most low-hanging fruit, the most likely to buy your product, you're not going to make it work anywhere. You're not, you're not going to make it work at scale. So don't bite off more than you can chew. You know, because then you're just going to be overwhelmed and you're going to be sitting there trying to do way too many things. Start small, do the simple things really, 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 really well, prove that it works, and then expand from there. So in seeding a marketplace, there's a lot of hustle and, and I will say like the pay for inventory, fake it till you make it, is real. You know, don't tell your customers on the other side that you're doing it. But, I mean, we bought 65 parking spots in Toronto after we got the press and didn't have any parking spots in, in order to make sure that the app actually had usability. And we lost money on those spots. You know, we were paying, it's amazing how expensive parking is, but we were paying, if you're an individual, you could buy the parking spot for 200 bucks a month. But as soon as you're a company, you have to pay $400 a month. So you know, we were losing $200 a month on a parking spot, but we were building our marketplace and we were getting spots in the best area and now we don't own any of those parking spots anymore. It's all people who are on the system. So seeding a marketplace is very much a chicken and egg problem. You need to grow it in tandem, which is very, very difficult. So if you are thinking of starting any business, marketplace or not, just make sure you start small and can prove that it'll actually work. The second part is growing a marketplace. And I mean, growing any company, as anyone who's done it here knows, or even growing a sales portfolio, is, is really, really difficult. And it takes time. It takes using your connections. It takes networking. It takes proving that you have a product that can add value. Um, the biggest thing in growing a marketplace is creating a replicable process. So it comes back to point one. You know, once you've seeded this small area, you've learned what worked. You probably took a year and made a million mistakes to try and get it there, but you now have a bit of a formula for how it works. So now you need to roll that formula out again, and you need to make a whole bunch more mistakes. And you just need to keep going through that build, measure, learn feedback loop because if you don't learn from your mistakes, you're not actually going to grow. And if you're scared of making mistakes, you're also not going to grow because, you know, the name of the game now really is innovation. And if you don't go out there on a ledge and really try and push something new and learn if it works or not and get burned a couple times, you're, you're just not going to grow at the pace of which other companies are doing that. Um, network effect and referral. So, you know, the reason, there's a couple of reasons I do these speaking events. You know, one, one for me, it's actually personal growth. You know, it's good to get up in front of people. It's, you know, it's a nerve wracking experience to be frankly, to be frankly honest. But, but, it, but it helps build your confidence. It helps build your character. The second is completely network effect and referral. The more people I talk to and tell about Rover, the more people will hear about Rover. And in technology, Network effect is what builds every single company. And so your goal is that as long as every person who downloads your app refers at least 1.1 people to your app, you will always grow. No matter what, you will always grow up because there's always one person comes in and then they bring in 1.1 people. So you will always continue to grow. But as soon as they're not referring people to your app, that referral process just ends. If it's below one, if you have 100 people and then they only refer 95, then those only refer 85, then 75, then 65, then 22, you then have to pay for every additional customer and you're paying for a referral feedback loop that, w that will not work, that does not function in and of itself. Uber, Airbnb, TaskRabbit, you know, you can, you can name 
50 different companies all grow based on word of mouth referral network effect. You know, it's why there's all the give 10, get 10 stuff. I mean, I could eat, I could eat for free for the next, how many people are in this room right now? 40, 50? I, I could eat for free for the next 50 days if you guys all use my referral code for Ritual. <laughs> I could eat for free for the next 50 days, right? And Ritual loves paying for that because they just got 50 new customers that they hope when they use it will tell another you know, at least 53 customers along those lines. So referral feedback, it's super, super, super important. And it sort of comes back to what, what Frank said earlier, is you need, to, you need to build a product that people love. If you don't build a product that people love, then it's not gonna actually work. And that's where growing a marketplace really comes into itself. You can have a crappy product when you're seeding a marketplace because all you're trying to do is to see if people really want to use your product. Do you have something that people want? When you're growing a marketplace is when you sort of become a real business. And that's, and that's where Rover is sitting right now. Um, you know, we've seeded it. We've had some early traction. We're sitting at product market fit. And now we need to look at scaling into a company. So, the third, one, the third one was scaling a marketplace. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that today because I don't have experience doing that yet. But hopefully in a year's time, if you'll have me back, I'd, uh, I would talk about scaling a marketplace. Um, so what did, what did I learn in doing this and you know, what can maybe help you guys um, if you look to starting a marketplace or a company? I'll be kind of quickly on this because I talked to some of it as I went. Um, be wary of PR. I don't, does anyone here have experience with, with PR or in using it for sales? What, what's your? Yeah, you're, you're right. you only get one, you only get one shot. You only get one shot. And, and you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't really believe that or know that when you started. Like, the press are fickle. They want a headline that people will read and they won't do that headline twice. So. You can usually get press for a launch, specifically in the tech community, but be very, very, very tactical as to when you use that because you won't get it a second time. You know, we haven't got a second wave of press. We've got a lot of press, but we haven't got that wave of press. And when, when everyone's talking about it on the, at the same time, that's when you really create trust and you really get a lot of people doing it. The one-off articles don't really work as well. Um, Start small, don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, people are inherently trustworthy. So when I, when I started Rover, the biggest, you know, the biggest question that always came up was, you know, what's gonna happen if I run out of my parking spot and I come home and the car's still in the spot? Well, that would suck. <laughs> Fair. But, but, it, but it's, a re it's a real problem, right? Like if you're making eight bucks a day, and you come home and you got the groceries or you got the kid in the back and you come pull into your driveway and there's a car there and you can't park, you're gonna, you're gonna be pissed. And so like, investors were worried about it, we were worried about it, we tried to build stuff in the, prop, in the product to worry about it. I spent way too much time worrying about this problem that happens but in like 0.5% of our transactions. So think of what's working out there. If Airbnb can work, then renting out your driveway can work. So try and think of the, the pair, like the, the similar companies to yours and what their problems are because it's very likely that the initial problems that you think of based on how people act aren't actually gonna be the problems that, that, that prohibit your company from growing faster. Um, the customers always right. I don't actually agree with that. They're not always right in, in, this, in this new age of technology. I mean, I guess the use Rogers or tell us is an example. We've now been bred to call and yell at the people on the other line because if we yell at them, we get pushed to a manager and then we might get a discount on our product. We, we've come to expect so, 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 so much that if you coddle your users, too much, they're going to expect this service all the time, and you, you can't do that as a business. So to give you an example, um, when, you know, when we have homeowners who break our car cardinal rule, which is just 
make your spot available when it's available. That's all you have to do. When, when we run into problems and a car comes in and the homeowner's car is there, we were, we were very lenient with them because we didn't want their supply to come off our product. We needed their supply. Supply was the biggest thing that we needed. And so we said, oh, it's okay. You know, just make sure you do it next time. We can come help you. You know, we can turn the spot on and off for you if you want. Just send us a message. And we created, we created monsters out of our users who just expected us to do absolutely everything. So you, you need a really strong code of conduct with regards to it's a fine line between customer service and doing too much because as you grow a marketplace, you're not going to be able to handle that amount of, that amount of hand holding to move it forward. Um, don't worry about your competition. If you're worried about your competition, don't start the company. I mean, they're doing, and this, this goes for everything. I mean, know what your competition's doing. You know, make sure you're educated on your market. But don't worry about them. You know, you have too much to worry about starting your own company or running your own sales funnel. Like, don't worry about that shit. Worry about your own company and worry about pushing that forward. Um, and then last but not least, listen. Really listen to what your customers are saying. I think, you know, I, I'd imagine if you've been to a couple of these, I bet everyone has said it, most people try and sell a solution. No one really wants to hear the solution. They want you to listen to what their problem is. And if you can truly understand what that problem is, you won't even need to sell them the solution in the same time. So you got to listen, 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 listen. And this, I mean, this is sales. This is your personal life. Like, this is, this is absolutely everything. I used to be a terrible listener. And I worked on it very diligently. And it's, uh, it's really helped me really helped me grow both, both personally and, and in my business career. Um, quickly on how we did it, I don't, what time is it? I don't want to go. We got, uh, if you want to do some questions, it's a quarter after. It's quarter after right now? OK, so I'll, I'll rip through this quickly. So we, start, we started really small. We did neighborhood by neighborhood. We broke Toronto into 20 different zones. And we literally focused on those zones. So I know how many apartment buildings are in a zone, how many driveways are in a zone, um, how many schools, how many churches. And then I know why people are parking in those areas. So you need to be very, very targeted on that stuff. Um, and the same on demand generation, on creating that supply. You know, We went through PR, customer experience, digital marketing, community. And customer experience is at the top because you do need that customer to have a great experience. But more so than that, you need to understand when people have a bad one, why they're having a bad one. So we actually concentrate way more on the negative experiences than we do on the positive experiences. Um, we learned quickly that driveways weren't enough. We needed to go after underground parking. So in you know, regular startup fashion, we very quickly built some hardware that we could install in the building. And I convinced a big property manager to allow me to install stuff right to their garage door. And we're testing it in four buildings right now. It's, it's awesome. It's like an open sesame button where you drive up to a garage door. You don't have a fob or anything. You press a button, and it opens the garage door for you. And now you can park in underground parking. But we did this through hustle, and we did this through sales and pushing someone to actually try something um, that was very much outside of their comfort zone. Um, so I said I wanted to do um, a bit of an exercise. I don't think we're going to have time to do that. But who has heard of Lean Canvas? OK, okay quite a few people. So Lean Canvas, I'd, I'd really encourage every single person in this room to look up Lean Canvas and do this exercise. Essentially, essentially this is a one-page business plan that you are supposed to create in 20 minutes. So you're supposed to look at the problem, the solution, what your key metrics are, cost structure, value proposition, unfair advantage, channels, and customer segments. Is that one right there? Yeah. See? There's one right there. Young students are already on it. It's... <laughs> in 20 seconds. It's... And it does. I mean, they say 20, and it takes, it takes an hour. But the, the beauty of this isn't to do this for your entire business. It's to take a small subsection 
of your business. So it's to take one single customer segment and then think of the problem that segment has, the solution, the unique value proposition. I have 20 of these for Rover, 10 on the supply side and 10 on the demand side. Because what it allows you to do is break down your business really, really, really fast in a very simple way to try and uncomplicate it, right? If you think about everything that goes into a business, you know, from you know, insurance to HR to sales to like everything, there's so many things. But it really, at the end of the day, comes down to do your revenue streams make more than your cost structure? And you can get to that, you can get to it in 20 minutes. Like, you can do it, it's, it's very difficult. But the point of doing it in a short period of time is to not think too much about it, right? Put it down, run through it, and when you get good at it, I, I, I promise you this will help you in a sales job, this will help you with business. It just allows you to very, very quickly get a snapshot of where your company's headed. And then second, it's from the same vein of things. Has anybody seen these test and learning cards before? So it's from, it's from the same company that started Lean Canvas, or one of them. Um, this one's from Strategizer, so I'd check it out. It's all about A-B testing. So it's all about very quickly testing a hypothesis and understanding if it will actually work. So it takes you through four different things. It's very, very simple. We believe that there's high, high, our hypothesis. To verify that, we will do this. So what are the actual things that you're going to do to verify your hypothesis? Because the amount of times we put things into action because of our own biases and we think it's going to work is I guarantee every single person in this room. Like I do it. No one goes through this simple four steps. So to verify that, we will do this. And we will measure it in this way. Like How are we going to measure that this will actually work? And then the most important one, we are right if this happens, right? And if you're not right, that's okay, because then you go into the learning card, which is we believe that, but we observe that this happened. From that we learned, therefore we will. And this is build, measure, learn. This is very quickly going through the steps of testing something to see if it can work. That exercise takes three minutes when you're thinking of something that you want to do. From, I mean, think about going to a new sales client and you wanted to try a new sales presentation. Literally, just go through it. I believe that by changing this presentation that this is the end effect. Like, this is what's going to happen. And I'm going to know that because he's going to buy my product or whatever it may be. If it doesn't happen, you can then go back and understand you know, how it works. These are very basic. These are very startup. But I would highly suggest that everyone just take an hour and run through it and look through these things. Because I guarantee what it will do, specifically in traditional sales and specifically in older businesses, is it's going to help bring to light some of the things that you probably haven't thought about for a while. You know, the, the old manufacturing company that I was in that I helped grow and sell, you know, we were, we were very much in an old sense of how we approached our customers. Um, and had I used this, I think we would have grown, uh, grown a lot faster. So I'll shut up now um, and, uh, and, and move on to some questions. I talked for too long. Um, but hopefully you found that useful and, and happy to, to answer any questions. <clears throat> I had a neat idea. I don't know if you've thought of it, of it before, but um, I know that a lot of people are looking into living out of their vans and stuff like that, traveling the country. I'm wondering if you have a time limit on your parking spots and if maybe that might be a new marketplace for you. I, I haven't, I personally haven't thought about it too much, but a lot of people have well, said that to me because it's bigger. It's bigger vehicles. It's people who need somewhere to park every single night, and yeah. it's a way bigger industry than I than I ever thought. Maybe when you scale up, that's something. It's 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 super interesting, but that's the key. Mm -hmm. 
it because you're traveling around, it needs to work across North America. Yeah, yeah. It can't just work in Toronto because how are you going to hit the people who are coming to Toronto? Like, how are you going to market? But no, it's, it, it is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Please. just jumping off oh. yeah. point. Uh, I'm just <laughs> jumping off of her point. You could have like a timer on your. Why don't I do this so people can actually hear? <laughs> you could have a timer on your app, and if they're over that time, you could judge them. And, and that's exactly what we do. Nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure. So the way that we've dealt with it, <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm like a, I'm like a parking attendant now. You guys are all gonna hate me. But honestly, no, nothing, nothing gives me more pleasure. So the way, the way that I get so, we call them bandit parkers, and just, and it's not usually the rover user. It's just people parking illegally. But the way we built it into the app is if someone shows up to the parking spot and the spot's occupied, they get prompted to take a photo of the license plate. We're then able to run the license plate through our system. And if it's a rover user who, say, hasn't been in the app that day and is just a punk who's deciding to try and park for free, I have their credit card information and I charge. Yeah. And it feels great. Yeah. Yeah. But in the same way that if you miss an Uber, if you miss an Uber, you get charged for missing that Uber. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually uh, wanted to go back to what you were saying about listening. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and sometimes I'll say something and I'll be like, oh, that wasn't the right thing to say or whatever. And so I just find if I transition to listening, I'm going to find people's needs better. I'm going to be able to help them a little bit better. So I'm trying to do that. Do you have any tips? Because you said you really worked on it really hard. And I, yeah. that is what I want to do. I just want to focus on Do you have any tips like books, audio podcasts, anything we listen to or anything that you can recommend for that? I, I did read a couple books. I, I honestly didn't find them that, that helpful. Yeah. Um, shut up. <laughs> it, it's it's really hard, but no, but that but but that that it's so hard. It's hard, and 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 that was that was it for me. Like my one one of the developers on my team, um, you know, he knew I was working on it, and he pulled me aside after a meeting. He's like, Tim, are you working on this? I think you talked for half that meeting, and, and like you're just supposed to be getting an update, not giving an update. Um, it, you just literally in your head, constantly just listen, 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 listen. I, I that's what it was for me. I, I just wanted. To, I've had the same issue, yeah. and I've been told knowingly by friends and family that I need to shut up as well. <laughs> yeah. So I've worked really hard at doing it, and a lot of it, to be honest, even right now is. It was killing me not to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I, I, I uh, bite down my jaw. Like, I literally clench my teeth to prevent myself from speaking. It's hard, still, to this day. Yeah. That was just another idea I wanted to share. Yeah. Because I like to talk. I think, too, just being present, too. Like, listening to what yeah. they're saying. Sometimes they find, like, Actually trying listen. Up, yeah, trying to come up with your response while they're talking. Like, yeah, you can't. Crazy, it, it's, crazy. it's the. It's the I feel like we do it all People, people who have a hard time remembering names is often because, like, as you're shaking your hand, giving your name, you're thinking about the next thing you're going to yeah. say. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about the name that's coming out of the person's mouth. Right. Um, and it's just, it is just training, like, constantly thinking about it. Just like, listen, listen, listen. I. I didn't find any great techniques other than telling people that I was doing it, okay. um, which also opens some transparency and, yeah. and, and opens some trust because some of the people I told didn't really notice that I was doing that, but those were generally the people who also don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the people who were good listeners really, really appreciated it. Um, and that transparency actually created a stronger bond and even sense of teamwork by, by actually doing it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So you, uh, you kind of talked about building, you know, start with a small neighborhood. Yeah. Which was something like Ritual, you've got your users and your suppliers in that same small geographic area. How does it work for you guys where you've got demand in a small area and then customers all over the place? It's, we're still trying to figure it out, which is, which is why we're not at scale yet. Um, 
the, the tactics that we have done ha have been very old school and rudimentary. On, on the demand side, we know who's parking there because their car is currently parked there. So we're gonna put a flyer on your car or we're gonna stand at the front of that parking lot and hand out flyers or we're gonna set up you know, a stand in the area and just build community that way. Or we're gonna go into or call all the offices that are there and say, hey, office manager, how do I get this in? We're trying to give your employees free parking um, in this area, how do we, how do we get this message out to them. So it's, it's super hyper local. We, we do do Facebook ads, and I'm sure there's been some talk on, on that here. Like we do do a bunch of Facebook ads, but we find we can't even get targeted enough. Um, Facebook ads and, and Google's well worked really well for us in our spots near universities, so, so near U of T and Ryerson and George Brown, um, but did not work well in areas where, as you said, People are coming from everywhere, right? You know, they could they could be coming from Whippy, they could be coming from Hamilton, they could be coming from Barrie, but they're all winding up at Young and Eglinton. It, it's really hard to hit them unless you hit them while you're while while they're actually there. Yeah. So why don't you do that? Pardon me. So why don't you do that? We do. Okay. Yeah, I, I literally yesterday afternoon I was out in the field for three hours still, you know, handing out flyers and talking to. Like it's 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 grind hustle and you, you just gotta do it. Um, I have two things. Uh, I'm wondering if people can sign up to be a parking spot outside of Toronto. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, I just before when we were talking about about listening, I wanted to uh, share a tip that I've learned. And for me, I've just conditioned my brain to be asking questions more. When people tell me something, I ask the question about that statement. Yeah, that's good. And just doing that kind of conditions the brain to be in listening mode. Yeah. That's helpful. Yeah, that's a good tip, for sure. Tim, just uh, yeah. oh sorry, no go ahead, Bill. Is it Bill? Oh, sorry, that's me. Good. Sorry, I'm in the uh, I'm in the insurance business and I always think about Murphy's law and you mentioned it. What are the ramifications of the homeowner when they're running out their spot? Can I ask you that for yourself? <laughs> yeah. So so from an insurance standpoint, there's not really any. Um, car insurance covers your car if it gets hit by lightning in the middle of a field or parked in a green pea lot or anywhere. So the only, the, the only issue a homeowner can run into from an insurance standpoint is if the person parking there doesn't put their parking brake on and it's in an incline and the car flies into their, flies into their garage. Um, dependent on the policy, um, it may or may not cover that. So we have an overarching insurance policy that we can use based on a business decision. We don't have to use it because we're just a broker, like we're arm's length. But we need to create trust with our homeowners. So in situations like that, which never happened, um, we would step in and cover it and go after the auto policy as well. Well, it's just an interesting thing. And maybe your next round table, you might talk about Murphy's Law mm -hmm. and think, you know, what can go wrong. I mean, yeah. when I think of the designated driving services where a car follows another car, so the driver of my car all of a sudden backs into somebody. Yeah. He's saying, oh, it's not my problem, phone yeah. the designated driver company. It's not my problem, we're just a broker. Yeah. And I'm the car owner, I'm stuck with an accident. But so these things, you gotta just sort of go around and and the insurance industry is really, they're, they're starting, like I'm actually working with a company right now to look at policies that will cover it based on time parked and you know minute by minute. So insurance companies are starting to see that there's a lot of profit in the sharing economy, but it's still a long way off before, before there's products that are very, very easy to, to manage. Yeah. Can I just get one last yeah, question yeah. in? So for all of us, oh, sorry Matthew, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah. Thanks, Tim. Awesome presentation. I felt like we got a lot of um, knowledge on the external process. And uh, forgive me if you kind of touched on this at the beginning no, no. because I was playing with your app. Nice. Good. Uh, yeah, everyone download it. Download it. You don't have to listen to me if you're downloading it. I'm, I'm really interested in like your passion. Like, What was the inner driving engine for all this? Can you just touch on that a little bit? Yeah. I. 
I think it was just I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. You know, as a as a kid, I was the one who bought the first burner device and sold CDs to my classmates. Um, you know, in, in university, my work terms were co-op work terms, uh, all in the entrepreneurial vein. So I, I always wanted to start something. Even the company that I helped grow and eventually exit was a family company that my grandfather had started. Um, and my grandfather was a huge entrepreneur. He was a, he was a engineer, so he was much more practical than, than I am. Um, but he was, he was absolutely brilliant and he really instilled entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurship into me. I just, I needed an idea. Um, and it's, it's hard to find an idea that you're willing to quit your job for, but sometimes you just got to do it and, and you just got to run with it. Um, and while it's, I mean, it is, it is up and down and I was having this conversation beforehand. I mean, a lot of people think about entrepreneurship because, hey, it's flexible and you know you can make a lot of money and you know you have control over your time yeah no uh, <laughs> you know i i'm surprised i'm still in a relationship right now because like all of my time all of my time is on rover and and that's and that's and that's really really difficult but if you don't have the passion for it you you won't you won't be able to see it through because it is hustle and grind yeah. Um, so Tim, I think if it's okay, I'll just ask one last yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, could you share with us uh, the power of using data to make business decisions and sales decisions? For sure. Yeah, definitely. So we, has anyone heard of Mixpanel? So Mixpanel is, I guess they're not still a startup, but it's the, it's the analytics tool that we use. So um, I can see every screen that you went to in the app when you downloaded. So I can see that you went from login, you checked out how to list a spot, you went to the parking screen to see it. So I can see every user flow that, that our users are doing. And the important part of that is that I can attribute that back to a sales process. So if I were to, and I should have done this, I should have had a promo code to give you guys to download the app. Right? And if you downloaded it here, I'd be able to track how many people from this audience downloaded the app and then parked or list, listed their parking spot. And then I'm able to extrapolate that back to was this worth it from a strictly business standpoint. It's like, okay, I spent X amount of dollars and time and we were able to get this many parkers. The, the power of that data is so, so important and it's so much easier to get now. Like I pay $75 a month for this service. I don't have to pay a massive amount to get business intelligence set up. I just have to get my developers to make sure we're tracking the right metrics. And the most important part about data, we have so much data. We're, we're, no matter what business you're in, you're overwhelmed with data. You need to know what data matters. You know, I sat down with, it was the ritual guy again, and he's like, don't, Tim, don't get into analysis paralysis, right? Don't analyze every single piece of data because then all you're gonna be doing is staring at a spreadsheet and you're not actually gonna be growing your business. Figure out what those key metrics are. Like what is really driving your business? And it's only three, like get three or four of those metrics. What are those main ones that if it increases by 3%, your revenue increases by X. Um, focus on those and know them, know them cold because you know, whether you're on the business side and you need to arm a sales force with data, if you can arm that sales force with, hey, we know that, we know that this segment performs 80% better than this segment, don't even touch this segment right now. Like just focus, 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 focus. We, we think too broad, um, and we've made that mistake a lot. We think, everyone, we think everyone wants to use our product or buy our product, but you need real data to back up who's actually using it. And if you have that real data, you can action on that data, and you will get real results um, and grow a lot faster. Yeah. Thanks, Good. Thanks guys. <laughs>
So again, thank you. Our next one is September 19th, and you're in for another treat. Her name is Marie Chevrier. Marie was a true story. She used to be on Young and Dumbass in a Nidia towel, handing out Nidia samples. And she thought, there's got to be a better way for us to get samples into people's hands. And guess what? She started sampling. Uh, they did almost $2 million in sales last year. This March alone, she did $600,000. Okay? And I'm happy to say that I did invest in her. So she's gonna come and share her journey with us, and that's September 19th. Have an awesome summer, enjoy, play safe, and God willing, we'll see you back here September 19th. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello there, my name is Frank Audino. I am the president of OPN, that is Open People Network. We're here at our 15th Up Sales Talk, where we try to bring in an individual every month to share their experience, and it could be a startup or a business that's been around. Uh, today, uh, June uh, the 20th, we were very fortunate to have with us Tim Wooten. Tim is the founder and CEO of uh, Rover Parking, and he just delivered an awesome uh, event to about 70 people in the room, and the talk was on uh, the Uber of everything. Uh, I took a lot of notes, Tim. Okay. I have... So I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, yeah. specifically around, you talked about sales channels and customers. I think we can all understand that. Yeah. You talked about something very interesting. As an angel investor, we hear a lot about, you know, it's a $30 billion market and I'm going to go after it. You mentioned those same stats. Yeah. Can you talk just a little bit about the importance of proving your concept locally, hyper-local, and then using that model to replicate, please? For sure. Yeah, I, I mean, in general, you need to start you need to start small. You know, the, the genesis that we say is if you can't make it work in a small area, how, how are you going to make it work in a big area? So specifically at the beginning of your venture, you need to figure out who that customer segment is, you know, who's the most likely to use that product. And, and then you got to find where they are and, you know, don't think that you can take on a whole city, take a small area, find as few as a hundred people, and see if you can get them actually using the product because if those 100 people that you think are the most likely people to use your product don't then you need to go back to the drawing board either on your positioning or on your on your product as a whole um carrying on that thought uh you said something really awesome that i almost wanted to stand up and cheer <laughs> as an angel investor as you know yep. most of the <clears throat> presentations always have this hockey stick where I'm going to go from zero to hero in two years. I'm going to make $75 million in sales. And you said something very interesting. Scale is really the difficult part to achieve. And it's not an overnight and it takes planning. Um, does it's that done. tie in into your canvas that you were talking about? Or is are you just talking about strictly on the scaling side of itself? I think <clears throat> the canvas is good because it ties into this answer. As early stage startups, I think we yeah. believe we're a product market fit before we're actually a product market fit. And so if you believe you're a product market fit too early and you start trying to scale too early, you're you're just going to burn money because yeah. your product isn't at a standpoint to be able to scale. You don't have the right mechanisms in place to get that proper feedback loop, to get the referral engine going, to actually handle increased increased customers. Um, so scale is without a doubt the hardest thing to do because you're getting out of that early adopter phase. And as soon as you're out of that early adopter phase, you better be ready to run and you better have those processes in place. So to me, it comes back to strong business fundamentals. I think we think too much about downloads and tying values to users, which isn't quite believable. You know, I'm of the mindset, figure out how to get to break even. If you can get to break even in a small area, 
then you know you can do this in multiple Great areas. Point. So point. so think about that revenue and think about how to get to break even. Uh, two last questions for Tim and uh, we'll let, because as a CEO, <laughs> it never stops. Um, build, measure, learn. Yeah, I wrote that, <clears throat> build, measure, learn. Can you explain a little bit to our audience uh, what you meant by build, uh, build, measure, learn in starting a, a startup? For sure. I mean, what is it? The definition of insanity is doing things over and over and over again with no change to the result. So build, measure, learn is just, it's it's a really simple process that you need to you need to build in everything you do at a startup and it's tracking what you're doing. You build it, you measure its effect and you learn from what customers are doing from it. And then you start all over again and it's, it's just continuous improvement. If you don't have continuous improvement in your startup and you don't learn from what you're actually doing, you'll never be able to build a replicable process. So you have to build it. You have to measure the success from it, learn from your mistakes and then start over again. And it just, it does not stop. And, you know, strategizer like the lean canvas and the test cards to me are the greatest tool for it because it takes no time to set out the parameters for the experience you're trying. But if you don't set them out, then you're never going to measure it and you're never going to learn. Where can um, uh, our viewers get this lean canvas? Just search lean canvas on the internet. It's free. Yeah. You can see it everywhere. I do use Strategizer for their test cards because Lean Canvas is good, but the Strategizer test cards so those are, are, your are two awesome. Tools that you're using uh, constantly. All the time. Yeah, we use Beautiful. them all the time. Yeah. And then lastly, uh, I try to <clears throat> preach this myself, Tim. It's the focus, the focus, the focus. It seems to me like you're a lion every morning. You're getting up trying to take down gazelles. Yeah. Um, can you explain, please, to our audience the importance of focusing and trying to? Uh, do one thing at a time, do it well before you start launching new businesses. You start a startup and there are a million and 12 things you can do every day. And it's very easy to stay busy. Like there's no shortage of things to do, but there is a prioritization of what has to get done in order to grow. And if you don't know what those are and you work on the stuff that's maybe a little easier as opposed to the stuff that is a priority, you're, you're, you're not going to grow. Um, so focus and process is so important. I wake up every single morning and use Slack with my team to send out the top three priority things that cool. I'm going to get done today. Very cool. And that has to align with everybody in the team and you have to move forward. But it's you can stay busy. It's not hard to stay busy doesn't mean you're busy on the right things it's not a productive busy it's not a productive busy and then you're just and then you're just running in circles so your head cut off and then lastly <laughs> sorry i'm taking way too much time of tim but i really enjoyed this conversation <laughs> lastly tim you mentioned up there about the importance of being coachable when you're starting a startup how important is that first of all to you as a ceo as you see it and then be for investors to see that i'm of the mindset culture is everything at the early stage of a company you are building something that you have no idea how it's going to work and if you don't have a team with a good culture that works together investors are going to they're going to they're going to see right through you um from the start and so you need to create and foster listening and understanding with, and, and trust within your team or, or else everyone's going to, it's going to be like a, you know, under six soccer game where everybody's chasing the ball in the same direction. It's not people working together to Great actually, <laughs> you know, to actually pass the ball and get it to get it in the net. There's no structure, There's no structure and, and, and you need it, but you can only create structure with trust um, and trust is what will, will really help an early stage startup really, really expand yeah. and be yeah. successful. Um, well, folks, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, uh, Tim Wooten, CEO, Rover Parking, please download the app, yeah. check it out. Uh, you enjoy it. 
I'm going to try it myself later on this afternoon. I'm actually going downtown Toronto tomorrow, so I'm going to give it a shot. But I wanted to thank again Tim Wooten from Rover. Thank you very much for being us here today. Thanks. Our next Upsales Talk uh, brought to you by OPN, the city of Whitby. And of course, the BACD out of Whitby is uh, September 19, where we'll have Marie Chevrier. And Marie is the CEO of a company called Sampler. Join us then. Thanks.